This is Mary Ann George with the University of Michigan's College of LSNA. We are talking with Robin Gavon, the Pulitzer Prize winning fashion editor of the Washington Post. Robin is a U of M alumna. She will deliver a lecture on the Washington Catwalk, the convergence of fashion, power, and politics on October 28th. The lecture is free and open to the public. I asked her some questions from her recent columns. Why does fashion matter in a society beyond the analysis of color, styles, and hemlines? You know, I've always had a pretty broad definition of what fashion really is. I mean, I don't necessarily see it as something that's just coming down a runway or a photograph in the pages of a magazine. I think it's really how we choose to present ourselves to the world, how we choose to define ourselves publicly. And a woman who wears a burqa versus one who uh, wears Chanel every other day of her life are are each carving out a different place for themselves in, in society and asking people to respond to them in different ways. The newest Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan has not accessorized her black robe with any personal touches, unlike Ruth Bader Ginsburg or William Rehnquist. What message can the unadorned black robe send about justice before the court? Well, it's probably a bit heretical for a fashion writer to sort of say that she doesn't want someone to accessorize their clothing, but I kind of think of the black judicial robe as pretty much a a perfect symbol of dignity and, most importantly, humility. It's already intimidating enough for just the average person to be facing the Supreme Court. So I, I think the robes, in a way, bring the judges down to at least a little bit uh, off of a pedestal, and it often hides, um, you know, expensive clothes or eccentric attire, anything that sort of makes, I think, the judge seem like they are um, an individual passing judgment as opposed to a representative of the law. Michelle Obama's preference for both high-end and off-the-rack fashion has been endlessly analyzed for the messages that it sends. What will her wardrobe on the campaign trail attempt to accomplish? Well, I think some of this is trying to, you know, get inside of of her head, which isn't possible. But I do think that she's been very cognizant of the implications that her clothes have. And uh, she's been very savvy about mixing sort of mass market brands like J. Crew and Talbot's with more high-end pieces. And often those high-end pieces are from small design houses, people who could be um, defined as small business people. So I, I think that, you know, is part of her way of sort of delivering a message that, you know, this is not just about fashion and glamour. It's also a reflection of of our economy and, and who we are. But I also think that, you know, she's got to walk a tricky line. She's not just a candidate's wife, she's also the first lady. So she has to kind of maintain that role while she's also sort of dabbling in the political. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton recently decided to grow her hair out into a longer layered length in Washington, where short hair is the norm for women over 50. What broader implications are there for women of a certain age in Secretary Clinton's new coif? I was really struck by the amount of feedback that I received when I wrote about uh, Secretary Clinton's longer hair. Women who were older, some of them sent me photographs of themselves with longer hair. And I think in a lot of ways there's this sort of expectation that when a woman reaches a certain age, she's kind of grown out of flirtatiousness and girlishness. And those are all things that are kind of connected to longer hair. So when a woman gets to a certain age and everyone's sort of looking at her and saying, you know, why are you wearing your hair so long? It's almost like they're accusing her of, you know, why why are you still clinging to this idea that you can be flirtatious and whimsical? And I think that's unfair. Civil rights leader Dorothy Height, who died in April at the age of 98, was remembered for her feminine suits in lush colors and glorious hats. How did she use her distinctive style to further her message of equality and dignity? You know, one of the things that was really striking to me about Dorothy Hyde was that, you know, she was often the lone woman on stage. And as a result, I think she recognized that she wasn't just representing herself. She was representing sort of black womanhood. She was representing a whole enormous group of people. And with her clothes, for me, one of the the most striking things was that it wasn't just about, for her, this idea of 
expressing quality. It was also recognizing that dignity was also on the table, but that no one needed to give her her dignity. She already had that, and that all came through in her clothing. And I think even now, as we look back, you know, we can sort of look at the clothes that she wore and be reminded that you have to respect yourself before anyone else will. We have been talking with Robin Gavano, the fashion editor of The Washington Post.